everyone, and welcome to a bonus episode of our podcast. This is not a Stephen King-related podcast this time, but I think if you s- decide to stick around, you'll be very delighted that you did, because I'm very honored to have as a special guest with me today, Robert J. Sawyer, the uh, science fiction writer who's known as the Dean of Science Fiction in Canada. Hi, Rob. Hi, Lou. How are you doing? Great. It's awesome to see you again. And our paths have crossed many times. I've been very honored to be able to listen to you speak many times. You're very well known uh, in the science fiction field, and for people who like horror, your last novel, Quantum Night, actually has a pretty interesting horror hook in it. Yes, that's true, actually. It's a novel about a notion I think Stephen King would have been quite comfortable with, which is, what if most of the population was not just figuratively mindless in what they do, but was literally mindless, was without conscious inner life? And in fact, the title I wanted to use for the novel was the philosopher's zombie, uh, yes. <laughs> because that's the term that's used in philosophy of mind or in cognitive studies about this notion that I can only be sure I have an inner life. I can't be sure that you do, Lou, or that any of the listeners do. It's only by right. analogy with my own inner life that I can assume that they must have one too. And of course, the zombie word conjures up the walking dead. But yep. in this sense, it is kind of an, a non-life, a non-self-aware life that I'm talking about. And the novel postulates a experimental psychologist who discovers that most of humanity has no inner life, that they are, to some degree, zombies, to some degree, The Walking Dead. Ultimately, the marketing department had me come up with a different title. The book is actually called Quantum Night. Yes, and the scariest monsters are actually the ones that turn out to be people. And I think this whole idea that you came up is with for this book is very for me it was very disturbing i mean i found myself looking at the mirror at myself and sometimes i'm wondering well <laughs> what category do, of uh, people would i fall into based on the, the the premise of your novel and i was wondering if you could expand on it a bit because i think that's a piece of the novel that you project uh, based on the research that you had done sure absolutely but since it is a stephen king podcast maybe i should get my stephen king cred in first oh okay. and just say that this novel quantum night was the last novel sold by a man who was Stephen King and my mutual literary agent, Ralph Vichinanza. Oh, Ralph right. died about five years ago, but I had a three-book contract, which for Stephen is a year's work. <laughs> for me, is five years' work to uh, to get it done. And so certainly the prosperity of the literary agency that represented me for many years came on the heels of Stephen King. If you go and visit Ralph Vichinanza's office in New York, you would see file drawers labeled A.D., E to F, G to I, J, and then King 1, King 2, King 3, <laughs> King 4, off into the distance, a Stonehenge of filing cabinets, all devoted wow. to Stephen King contracts. Anyways, to your question, the novel takes as its premise this notion that there might be three distinct levels of human consciousness. And I did an enormous amount of research before I arrived at this premise. The first is what we like to think we all are, which is fully conscious with consciousness uh, and with conscience that we have an inner life that actually is not just a monologue. I want to do this. I want to do that. But really, we say monologue all the time about the inner life, but we really mean a dialogue. I want to eat this piece of cake. Yeah, but you're going to regret it, regret it later. You don't need the calories. I want to take this. Yeah, but it belongs to somebody else. I want to you know, do this thing. Yeah, but you're going to screw your buddy out of his turn, right? Right. And that is what we normally think of But when you look at the news, it's very clear that a great number of human beings aren't operating with any conscience. They may have consciousness, (laughs) but no conscience. Who would be that second stratum? Well, those who indeed are aware of what they're doing, but don't give a damn, have no empathy, care not one whit for anybody else. And we actually have a well-established name for that stratum. It's psychopath, something Stephen King has written about and others have written about in fiction psychopaths are usually depicted as being serial killers. But that's only one way a psychopath might end up. The sole defining characteristic of a psychopath is an utter and complete lack of empathy for other people. 
as it happens, you and I are both Canadian, and as it happens, the world's foremost research in psychopathy has been done in Canada. A man named Robert D. Hare, H-A-R-E, Hare like a rabbit, devised the worldwide gold standard in establishing whether or not somebody is a psychopath in a courtroom. It's called the Hare Psychopathy Checklist revised. And the characteristic of having no empathy is the overriding one, but there are 19, 20 parameters that lead to a conclusion that somebody has no empathy. So you see corporate CEOs clearly have no empathy. They can happily put 5,000 people out of work in the afternoon and go home and play with their dog in the evening. They care not one whit about what they do. Right. You can take the argument that surgeons and Hare makes this argument. Most surgeons are utterly without empathy. Although this is an audio podcast, you and I happen to have the video on as we're recording this. If I got a paper cut right now, you would wince seeing it. You would have empathy for me. A surgeon has to deal with way more than a paper cut. He has to slit you down the middle of your torso, spread your ribs, open you up, have a rummage around and not have the <laughs> single slightest bit of empathy for what's going on or he couldn't function. So there are pro-social psychopaths, pro-social in the sense that what they do doesn't hurt society, not that they have an agenda that is pro-social, that is to do good. And then I thought, okay, we understand these two groups, they're well-defined, but it doesn't explain how, forgive me, a Donald Trump becomes president of the United States. It doesn't explain how an Adolf Hitler became chancellor of Germany. It didn't explain how the masses of Japanese in World War II, who are now governed by something that's called the pacifist constitution and have given up any notion of ever being a war-making nation, blindly followed Hirohito and Togo and some of his leaders into a frenzied state of war. And the reality is, it seems that there are an awful lot of Japanese, an awful lot of Germans, an awful lot of Americans, heck, a lot of Canadians, a lot of homo sapiens who react simply to stimulus without any conscious thought. The lights are on, but nobody's <laughs> home. Right. And my novel character in Quantum Night discovers a way of identifying which of those three categories any individual falls into. I don't know what's the scariest part of it is that it could get to a point where this could be done as used as a test uh, to categorize people and who knows for what purposes that could lead to as well. I mean, it's a very scary, scary prospect. Well, this, of course, this is the question we have right now. We're facing one of the potential leaders for our conservative party here in Canada talking about a need for testing for Canadian values before we let an immigrant in. Donald Trump is talking on the same uh, basis. We have to test people yeah. to see if they're fit into who we want to have. And of course, even in, in, you know, in fantasy, we have the sorting hat at Hogwarts. <laughs> and certainly, I don't know how it was when you went to uh, through school in whatever jurisdiction you did, but certainly here in Toronto, Lou, they were still, when I was born in 1960, they were still doing streaming in the schools. They would do an aptitude test with you in public school and decide your fate, never discussing it with you, but say, this one here, he belongs in the academic track. That one there, he's never going to be anything creative. He's going to end up in the you know technical track. And that kind of testing goes on all the time in our lives. What a novel like Quantum Night tries to do is say, okay, let's take it to the nth degree because that lets us ask the really pointed moral questions about whether we should be doing this at all. Yeah, it's it's an interesting phenomenon because like obviously up here in Canada we're we're sitting back a little maybe superior to what's happening in the rest of the world, but there is the same kind of seems to be the same kind of undercurrent of uh, social forces or groupthink or whatever you want to call it that we're starting to see with uh, what's going on with our conservative party here. And I, I guess it's your book is as a writer you couldn't have asked for better timing for <laughs> for your book, which is now has been out hardcover for over a year and it's just starting to, uh, just recently has seen its release in paper. Paperback. So one of the things that science fiction writers love to do is predict the future. And your book has almost become a history textbook. <laughs> in a well, way. that's the set. Yes, <laughs> that's right. And it was not of all the predictions I've made over the years, the one that I most wanted to have come true. Because sure. the novel very directly predicts 
the emergence from out of nowhere of a far-right authoritarian psychopath as the leader of the Republican Party and ultimately the president of the United States with disastrous consequences for immigrants, disastrous consequences for foreign policy, and indeed, as the novel progresses, disastrous consequences for us here in Canada. And I was, people said, well, how did you predict Trump? Uh, you know, the book came out a year ago in hardcover, which means I finished it about two years ago. The answer is you look back nine years ago to the kind of candidates who were emerging to represent the Republicans in the states. And then five years ago, the even more uh, extreme right wing uh, conservative Christian candidates that were emerging to now indeed a year ago, the far right, there's not a one on that potential list of uh, Republican contenders against Hillary Clinton, who would have been a credible choice as president of the United States. And Trump was probably the worst of the lot. I mean, and Chris Christie had been a, you know, a state governor in New Jersey, despite the fact that he clearly done all kinds of things that should have disqualified him from that office, let alone the White House. So the trend was there. And that's what we do in science fiction. We we don't start from today and take a wild ass guess. Mm -hmm. We go back into the past, see how we got to today. What is the trend? And then simply extrapolate it forward into the future. And anybody who was doing that would see that the United States was, and particularly the Republican Party, was drifting farther and farther to the extreme right. The Tea Party, which emerged, you know, a couple of elections ago, now right. seems quaint compared to the alt-right and the Breitbart crowd and the people who have become the core audience that Trump is catering to. It's not an aspect I think that was too prevalent in your book, but I, I'm, I'm curious as your thoughts about, I think, like social media, the internet, because like, it's a double-edged sword. So like everybody has an opinion and everybody has an opinion. So it's allowed people who normally wouldn't have a, a voice to be heard. And it's like connected all these people that have similar points of view. And I, it's like given what I would sort of think was a much more isolated mind think about like driver's rage or, or car rage when you're a driver in your little cocoon of your car and there's this feeling of invulnerability. And I think that the internet, unfortunately, has, has become sort of an accelerant for that. And I, I don't know if that plays into how the mindset of stimulus that you were talking about, like with psychopaths and whatnot, but it, it does seem to be something that's I think really enabled what we've seen happen as well in the last couple of years. Oh, absolutely. In terms of the novel, one of the things that I do is my my two main characters are Canadian academics. Right. They're liberal Canadian academics. I mean, that's small L, not the Canadian Liberal Party, but <laughs> liberal Canadian academics. And that is its own echo chamber. Yes. Right. Yep. Uh, that is, it's we call it the ivory tower out of touch with real world concerns where things where many of, uh, of the topics that the right is so railing against are common coin is considered completely appropriate, such as, say, gender neutral bathrooms. I was just down on several university campuses in the last month. You know, most of them have gender neutral bathrooms now. It's a done deal in the academic cloister of the liberal left, whereas it's a major social issue that has to be fought at the far right. So no matter where you are on the spectrum, the danger of an echo chamber is absolutely pernicious and you have to be on guard against it. What happened in the latest po politics, the Trump politics, I think, is so, we heard this over and over in the campaign when people said, how can you support this guy? And he said, he's just saying what everybody thinks. Yep. What Trump did is he turned out to be a public figure. He was a reality store show star who started articulating the basest thoughts, grab him by the pussy, racist, homophobic, misogynist thoughts that perhaps some stratum of society routinely thought, but knew enough to keep their mouths shut about mm -hmm. at work, at, at church, or wherever they happened to be. Trump normalized that. He said, you know what? Speak up, say that, and you might find that the guy sitting next to you or the guy down the hall or the guy next door shares your view. And that was enormously liberating in the sense of letting the uh, monster out of the cage. Yeah. And maybe we, we can sort of segue from, the, from that concept that you put forth for Quantum Night and one of your other trilogies, The World Wide Web, which is probably more representative of the type of science fiction that you write, which is much more optimistic. Maybe we need that internet to gain sentience to police what's being said on the internet. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting thing because there's this huge conflict between the Americans have in their First Amendment. Now, 
that, note that. It's not in the Constitution as written. Right. It was the first thing they added to the Constitution. And, you know, the right to bear arms was also added later on. It wasn't the initial thought of the founding fathers. But the First Amendment says, among other things, the state, sorry, the federal government will make no laws abridging free speech. Right. And it's become considered that the number one thing that has to be protected in an open society is the ability to say anything you want at any time. And that's morphed into adding on a, a codicil without any consequences. Right. So that I can say something racist, homophobic, ableist, ageist, out, outright lie in terms of being news. Even the president, who right now, as we record this just uh, 48 hours ago, tweeted apparently a totally fabricated notion that President Obama had personally wiretapped President Trump. Trump's uh, offices, yeah. right? Yeah. And you can now literally say anything at all and have an assumption that the protection doesn't just give you the right to say it, but the right to be free from any consequences of having said it. Right. And that was never the intent. The internet, though, starting early on with people simply being anonymous trolls on the internet and graduating to people who can out and out make their whole public persona and indeed their internet fortune by being very public trolls, yeah. being very public, outrageous, demonstrably lying people and still have a huge audience that wants to lap it up. The internet is definitely, as you said, excellent word, been an accelerant for that. Yeah, it, it's it's hard because on the one hand, I, nobody would like, wants to go without the internet. I mean, it's become almost indispensable, but you remember growing up reading stories about people that became so dependent upon this type of technology that basically lived like in a virtual reality and very rarely came out of the matrix, I guess you could say, to uh, to experience real life. So it's it's a tough it's a tough policing issue. I, I, I don't know really if, what the answer is going to be for that. But like you said, the fact that there's this codicil of no consequences has allowed people to just really not respect, like it's a lack of respect for everybody nowadays, which is really kind of sad. And I don't really know, see a way to course correct that right now. It's scary stuff. But a course correction is definitely what's needed. What the mechanism for that is, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But as a science fiction writer, one of our standard storytelling modes is to say, hey, if this goes on, here's where we're going to end up. That's what one does in a novel like Quantum Night. The sad truth about being a science fiction writer, though, Lou, is you almost end up being Cassandra, the <laughs> prophet who was absolutely right, but nobody listened to her. All right. Because the number one best-selling book in the United States a couple of weeks ago, and still in the top ten, is George Orwell's 1984, hmm. first published in 1948. So we're talking, what, 69 years since that book came out. Uh, generations, lifetimes for many people since that book came out, and still it went unheeded. It mm -hmm. told us all the things to be uh, on guard against, the... The, the deliberate distortion of truth by those in power, all of it. And, and we paid no attention. Margaret Atwood, great Canadian writer, told us about the religious right wanting to seize control of women's reproductive rights in the mid 80s when she wrote The Handmaid's Tale. Right. And here it is decades after that. Oh, well, we didn't see this coming. Who knew? Margaret Atwood knew. George Orwell knew. I, I'm a Johnny Come Lately in this. Robert J. Sawyer knew. And we want people to pay attention. The sad truth is science fiction is the is always the, oh, well, I told you so genre, not, oh, thank God we averted that crisis genre. On the other hand, and the same thing there with technology has, because it's given so many voices, the voices of people like you is, it gets drowned out or easily washed in the ocean of content that's being pumped out day and day and out. Like you, there's just no way that you can see and read and do everything, which is, I think, another interesting way in that I think people feel in some ways they're more connected, but I think they're ever more fragmented and isolated because of this over overflow of information, which I, I believe Alvin Toffler talked about this in his novel, Future Shock, which is... Jesus. Well, his nonfiction book, yes. Future Shock. Yes, yes, not a novel, but yes. Yes, yeah. So, and, and people who may not be familiar with you probably know would know you best or more like, most likely from your TV series, Flash Horror, which was based on your book. I'm thinking that this book, Quantum Night, actually has the potential to be a, a TV series as well. And I think it could be such a great platform to show the dangers of what we're currently experiencing with technology. Well, thank you so much. I've actually had a number of very interesting meetings in Hollywood 
and Toronto about trying to get a Quantum Night television adaptation going. Who knows, right? right. You know, um, as you say, I did have success. I had a primetime network television series on ABC in the United States, Flash Forward. And so that certainly lets me get just about any meeting I want to have. Whether it'll happen, I don't know. But it would be, I think, the most timely. And the problem is, you know, right now there are shows like Designated Survivor at the reboot of 24 and Homeland that all seems not reality, a, a step away from reality mm -hmm. uh, and therefore fun escapism when President Obama was in office. And now that Trump is in office, it's like, oh, wait, you mean waterboarding? Might We, we might actually be doing that again? <laughs> oh, wait, we have a president who is completely unqualified for the job, who's been parachuted in? Oh, wait, you know, I mean, this sort of, it's almost hard to write a conspiracy theory about the United States or about its government right now that is crazier than the reality <laughs> that actually is going on. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking that too, like for a, lo a lot of writers, it must be tough to sit down at your desk and try to come up with something outlandish that is more scary than what's going on in the world today. I know I know for myself, but the, the amount of unease from a day-to-day -day following the news or whatever is is increased greatly because you just don't know what's what seems to be like this. There's no way that they can go past this line, but every day they seem to keep, keep pushing it further and further out. So like it's, it's going to end up like a game show. It's really kind of scary. Well, and who is the president? Former game show host, <laughs> Donald Trump. I mean, uh, The Apprentice was nothing but a game show, an elaborate one, but a game show. You know, I was talking to my uh, sister-in-law who has two daughters in her 20s, in their 20s, my nieces. Right. And I was saying not that long ago, I never thought in all of their life growing up, and I've you know, obviously been part of my life since they were born, I never thought they would face the same fears that you and I faced when we were kids of possible total nuclear annihilation. We had walked so far back from the precipice on that uh, in the last uh, decade or two since the full fall of the uh, Soviet Union, three decades now, that it seemed inconceivable that somebody would be talking about first strike with nuclear weapons, ramping up, rearming. And then Trump put all that back on the table. And yeah. suddenly my nieces in their 20s are facing the same existential fear that we all faced, thinking in the Cuban Missile Crisis, in Gorbachev and Reagan in the height of the Cold War, that somebody might actually push the button and end it for all of us. And that's such a scary thought to have. And yet it's a legitimate thought to be having now. Yes, it's like they say, history repeats itself. And unfortunately, we seem to be going through another cycle, which we had hoped with the progression that you mentioned since that last time to where we were now, that we would that would be behind us. But that... you know, you're yeah, exactly. We say history repeats itself, and that's been a maxim forever. But usually, it meant it repeated itself on long terms. People used to say that the famous saying is, "Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it." But in this case, it's not history in the sense of from books, right. from the ancient past. It is our lives. Those who fail to remember what they went through just a few decades before. Or, yep. and allow it to happen again. That's never what people with these commentaries about history meant. They never thought, oh my God, the same generation that had lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis or the, um, the, the Second World War would turn around and say, oh yeah, okay, I'm up for that again. Let's do it one more time. This time with feeling, right? We never thought that we'd be repeating the same mistakes in our own lifetimes. For sure. And I predict for anybody who's in a in the creative arts that works with based on horror <laughs> are probably going to become very popular. I think I think the horror genre is going to have a really big resurgence over the next uh, little while while this everything plays out. Well, the you know, popular fiction whether it's horror, science fiction, whatever, ties into the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. Yep. And it will be very interesting. Horror will either have a heyday or people will find that they just want something with bunny rabbits and sunshine <laughs> yeah. and rainbows because they need to escape <laughs> the yes. horror of their real life. It'll be fascinating to see uh, what uh, Stephen King and, and others do. But you notice that Stephen King has essentially himself set aside writing for the time being to be a very active opponent mm -hmm. uh, of Trump, to speak up vociferously against what he sees happening in the country. So he's writing a lot of op-eds. He's writing opinion pieces. He's speaking up and using the worldwide platform that a scant few authors managed to get yep. to, to speak out on what he sees as a real life horror. And one has to applaud him for that. 
Uh, absolutely. And, you know, he did the same thing a couple of years ago with the whole issue about gun rights. Uh, gun That's control right. As well, they wrote that uh, piece that he sold as well. So it's difficult when, uh, and you probably have a better pulse of the American people than uh, I do because I don't travel to the States very often. But when you meet them one-on-one, because -on -one, on I do have friends down there, they're they're just like you and me. Like they're just very personable people, and uh, they're they're very generous and gracious with their time. But it's when you get this collection, like this group mind thing going, it just you can't really compute the two. It's, it's yes, it's, it's, absolutely. I'm a dual citizen. I'm an American citizen as well as a Canadian citizen. My family, a large part of it, is American. In fact, I have more American relatives alive than I have Canadian relatives by far. Hmm. And I I love the American people. What I'm talking about has in Quantum Night about crowd reacting mindlessly and propelling people into power who demonstrably don't have their own best interests at heart, the, the crowd's best interests at heart, isn't an American phenomenon, as I tried to allude earlier, isn't a, 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 a Japanese phenomenon, it isn't a German, it's homo sapiens. Yep. It is something we do. There's a huge stratum of us, whether or not you believe the conceit in my novel about them being literally mindless, <laughs> there's a huge stratum of us who prefers to be led rather than to lead. Sure. And I mean, indeed, not, you know, not to use a, a dated and racist metaphor, but we've all heard it. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians is the way that uh, management falls apart. What you need is followers. What you need is for a leader to have 10, 100, 1,000, a million times as many followers as there are leaders, a billion times in the case of, of some countries. And understanding why people mindlessly follow, I think, is the single most important sociological issue facing the human race right now, because we're now seeing again and again and again that people who are an existential threat to the human race, Adolf Hitler, the followers of Hirohito, are the followers of Donald Trump are put it, literally putting the whole world in jeopardy. Right. And and I got to say, you know, we've been you said we've been a little bit smug here in Canada. I don't mean to hog the mic here, but you know, you only have to go back a couple of years to when we had demonstrably the more conservative government than the United States did during the Obama slash Harper, Harper being Canada's prime minister, right. years, we did not have the good record on climate. We did not have the good record on indigenous rights. We did not have the good record on immigration. We did not have the good record on dialing back militarism. So it's easy to be smug, but we have to remember <laughs> that there, but for the grace of the random forces of human nature, go <laughs> us. Nicely put. And in, in this era of uncertainty, what is Robert J. Sawyer keeping himself busy with these days? You know, Quantum Night, I'm very proud of the book. And if it's my final book, I will not object to that. I think it's a good summation of everything I wanted to say uh, as a novelist. I find that the current state of the publishing industry is appalling. There are a handful of authors, Stephen King being one, who can essentially dictate terms to right. publishers and get whatever degree of royalties and advance and retain whatever rights they wish and so forth. There are literally a handful of people at that level of power. The rest of us are told by the five remaining big New York, and they're not New York, they're worldwide, publishing conglomerates, there are only five left, that we can't negotiate the terms. This is what royalties are. This is what your percentage on ebooks are. This is what's going to constitute being out of print, which means it's never out of print. Once you sign a contract with us, you're giving us control of your intellectual property rights forever. No big corporation, they have clout, does that. Disney does not license Mickey Mouse to a particular licensee to make T-shirts till the end of time. It's a five-year license or an 18-month license or a 10-year license or whatever right. with clear-cut terms about when it terminates. But this publishing industry is in such horrific shape that I'm not, I've not been inclined to accept any contract offers for a new book. I'm thinking I might write another one, but I'm going to do it at my own pace if I... I'm so moved. Right. However, we're in the golden age of visual content, of television and film. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of even just a few years ago, flash forward, when there were only really were the four great homes for television in the States, maybe five if you counted HBO, uh, the four broadcast networks and HBO. Now there's Netflix. 
making some of the best drama in television history, Amazon yeah. making some of the best. All of these other platforms are emerging. Uh, there's so much content being produced. And my original education was in writing for television. So I've come back to it decades later. I'm spending most of my time these days on film and TV projects and enjoying the heck out of it. Cool. And I know one of them, which since you and I are both from that era and grew up with the show was uh, the original Star Trek, you've also been able to write the, is, is, it is the final script for that. The series finale for the uh, the very well-regarded fan film series Star Trek continues. Yes. Most critics would say the best of all of the independent fan-produced Star Trek productions. Wonderfully acted, wonderfully written, uh, the episodes to date that I weren't wasn't involved with, wonderfully directed, and I was absolutely thrilled when they came and asked me if I would write the finale for the series. And it's in the can now, it won't premiere until probably this fall, fall of 2017. But all the principal photography is finished, and it looks spectacular. Awesome. And will this sort of serve as a, uh, without getting into spoilers, will it serve as a bridge between the end of the original series and the first movie in any manner? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was always our intention. Awesome. Was, it was quite clear that there was a huge untold story between the last broadcast episode of the original series and the first movie. Something had happened that caused Captain Kirk to give up captaincy of a starship and take a desk job. Something had happened that was so distressing to Spock that he left Starfleet, went back to Vulcan, and underwent the culinar discipline to try and purge all remaining emotions. Right. Something happened that was so drastic that Dr. McCoy left the space service and returned to private practice on Earth. What was that? Well, that's what the finale deals with. Wow. That sounds very ambitious. <laughs> well, you know, it is ambitious, but these guys, I knew when they uh, when, when they came to me and they did, you know, they said, hey, would you like to submit a proposal for our finale? I knew they were up to it. I knew that they had the acting chops to pull off very powerful scenes. You know, there's some actors that you can't do that with. We got to say, this is who we've got. You know, I love the $6 million man, but there was a very narrow range of things Lee Majors could do, <laughs> which led to a very repetitious quality to the show. He right. can do this. He can't really do that. He can't do long passages of dialogue. He can't do d deeply emotionally heartfelt scenes well. He can't do them, so don't write them. I knew with this cast I could write anything and they could pull it off. Oh, that's fantastic. I really look forward to it because that's that one of those what-if things that you've, as long Star Trek fans have always thought about, like what happened between the, the series and the movie. So I really, really look forward to seeing a, a version of that. And this this uh, instance of what you've done with the series is one of those great, I, I think, plus sides of technology, as you mentioned, Netflix and streaming. There's so much more freedom for artists to create works that cover a broader spectrum of content that's not restricted by the regulations that, you know, the traditional networks were always cobbled with. So that's the positive side technology. Now, we can argue about the compensation that, that takes place because of that. At, at the same time, that's another story. But I'm, I look forward to that. And I'm hoping to see other projects because for those who are not familiar with Rob, he's been no slouch in the piling up the books department either. He's got, you got Rob, 23 novels, is it? Quantum Night is my 23rd 20. novel. That's correct. And that's that's a pretty impressive slate as well. And some of them are, two of them are trilogies. The three are trilogies. Oh, three, three sorry. Three are trilogies. Oh, yes, that's right. The Farseer, Neanderthal, and the World Wide Web. Yes. A, a standalone book that's one of my favorite is Calculating God, which I would love to see made into a movie because I just think that's got a really important message, especially in, as with all great works it's probably even more relevant today than it ever has been so i'm really hoping to see not just you but other science fiction writers uh, and other writers being able to tell the stories that they really want to tell and have them adapted in ways that uh, are truer to the spirit without any restrictions on them well thank you so much you know back we were talking about the original star trek when it was on the air there were three networks yeah so if you couldn't get approximately a third of all the people watching tv you were a failure. Yep. Now there are hundreds of outlets. So you can do a show. You know, I love sci-fi in the States, the channel sci-fi, S-Y-F-Y. On a good day, they get a million viewers out of 300 million Americans, one third of 1%. Yep. And they can make shows as ambitious as Battlestar Galactica or The Expanse. These are both, of course, actually made in Canada. But that's, <laughs> that's beside the point. They can do, they can do really great shows. 
Along with the new upcoming Star Trek. And along with Star Trek Discovery, which is yep. being made in Toronto. That's right. They can do really great shows. And we found economic models to make it possible to do shows that are enjoyed by 800,000 Americans, a million Americans, 1.5 million, 2, 3 million Americans, which would have been instant cancellation. If you had an episode yep. of a show in the 60s that drew only 3 million people, and that was back when the population of the United States was half what it is today, you'd be dead. You'd be canceled at once. Yep. My God, you'd be canceled. And now there's an opportunity to tell stories to all kinds of audiences. And you don't need a huge audience to make it economically viable. And that's wonderful. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. And I'm looking forward to more works like that because even though something like, say, Childhood End, which is one of my favorite Arthur C. Clarke novels, even though I thought the adaptation was fairly faithful, it was done so late after the novel that uh, I think all the best ideas out of that story have been co-opted by other projects. And, you know, the image of the great spaceships over cities was stolen by uh, V or Independence, Independence Day. Independence Day, V, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the idea of, uh, spoiler, if anybody has read it, that the aliens in the book or look like the devil like all that kind of stuff that's the something that couldn't get made back in under the old model and it was something that i think could have had a really big impact if it had been done 10 15 20 years after the book it came out but unfortunately yeah, that was not to be so that's something that got made finally perhaps too late we can argue about that i i enjoyed it overall but i do agree that the impact that it was originally had uh, doesn't carry to translate as well as it, for today's audience but you know there's lots of other works out there that could be like philip k dick's stuff is still being adapted and it's still as relevant as ever too so there's there's lots of material out there that under the old model could get made and i'm really hoping does get the chance to see the light of day absolutely and but you're exactly right that the classics of science fiction childhoods and dates from the 50s uh, i believe for the novel have been so heavily mined yeah. by more contemporary properties that it's hard to find a big audience for them. But there's great science fiction being written right now. Setting aside my own stuff, there's great stuff by Robert Charles Wilson that's never been filmed. Paolo Bacigalupi that's never been filmed. Julie Trinata that's never been filmed. Marguerite Reed that's never been filmed. Nalo Hopkinson that's never been filmed. There's enormously powerful contemporary modern works to draw upon. And I do hope Hollywood will pay attention and, and adapt some contemporary science fiction too. Absolutely. And for, again, for people that don't know Rob that well, uh, this this is an example of, he's not only is he, uh, you know, the dean of Canadian science fiction, he's also a great ombudsman for science fiction. And you're a very big believer in the pay it forward type of philosophy, helping out those that are coming up from behind you. And I, I can speak from personal experience that you were always very gracious whenever we, we bumped into each other. I, I really remember during the World Horror Convention that was in Toronto and I was sort of wandering around by myself and you let me tag along with you. I, was, I really appreciated that. I don't know if you know that but because I didn't know anybody there. So that was something like that. That kind of stuff really sticks out to me. And I've seen you talk many times live and through YouTube and whatnot. And I've always appreciated that uh, your professionalism and your uh, willingness to help everybody out. And I, I look as you to you as a model as uh, how to conduct oneself, not just as a writer, but as a human being. So uh, I, to have you on the this special bonus podcast for me is is really a great honor. Well, thank you so much. My goodness. Going to give me a swell <laughs> head. Thank you. Thank you. But, you know, I mean, you're right. People were kind to me at the beginning of my career. And they didn't have to be. Yep. You know, in some sense, when there's somebody coming up behind you, they're the competition, right? Absolutely. And you see in a lot of workplaces where the old guy is really not nice to the new young guy because he knows he's gunning for his job. Yep. But it's a, it's a non-zero-sum game if you're in the arts. Yes. When somebody else succeeds, we all are better off, you know, uh, because of it, because our culture is enriched. And I, I firmly believe that. People helped me. I'm happy to help others. If I never write another book and never get another TV show made, you know what? And I know I'm fairly young by cosmic standards at only 56, but I'm happy to to sit back and become the gray eminence, at least of <laughs> Canadian science fiction. Yep. You know, there's there's a role for the elder states person who is not necessarily productive anymore, but is helping make things happen. And I'm not averse to to taking on that role. It is a function that that is worthwhile. And it'll just fit you like a glove as it is. So that uh, won't really be much work for you to start with. <laughs> you <laughs> well, just do you. it naturally.
So I really appreciate your time, Rob. Is there any other projects or any other things that you wanted to uh, communicate to to the audience before uh, I let you go? No, simply. Well, I'll say one thing, simply that Quantum Night, although it's shelved in the science fiction section, has an awful lot of people reading it, as is generally true of my science fiction, who don't think of themselves as science fiction writers. It's a novel set in the present day. It's a novel where everything is rooted in actual real science. There's the appendix at the back of the book that explains, you know, where the real science came from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very much, although I think more pro-science than anything Michael Crichton wrote, Michael Crichton being one of Stephen King's few peers, one of those who could dictate his own terms to the publishing industry. Right. Uh, but if you like Crichton's sort of contemporary scientific thrillers, I think Quantum Night might well fit your reading bill as well. Okay, there you go, folks. I I think uh, Rob's done a really good job of trying to entice you to check out his work, and I highly recommend it as well. As he said, it's very grounded. It's not like Star Trek stuff. It's what's happening could potentially happen within the next 10, 15, 20 years here. So, and given the current state of the world, it, it's always best to be prepared as much as possible. And uh, Rob offers uh, potential glimpses into that near future. Rob, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure, Lou. My pleasure. And I look hopefully forward to seeing you later on this year, maybe at uh, When Words Collide and uh, maybe the Rocky Mountain Ret Raiders Retreat. I don't know if you're planning either of those events this year. I'll be at both of those events. Okay, very cool. Thanks again. Take care, my friend. And everybody out there, hope you enjoyed this special bonus episode. Thank you. Bye-bye.